Okay, well, good afternoon. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to get right down to it because you are a very esteemed audience. I'm Tom Zimmerman. I'm a member of the research staff here at IBM. And I would like to share in nine and a half minutes um, oh, my five decades of experience in the invention ecosystem. So basically, my view is there are really three archetypes that are essential for doing an invention. You might have all three in one person, but that's pretty unusual. That's the Edisons. More so, you'd usually have one or two of these. And the most essential thing is to partner with someone or people. And you've heard in the last panel the importance of teamwork. And when I was a kid, I thought, for some reason, you had to do everything yourself, or that was, quote, cheating. Well, that is so wrong. So here are the three archetypes. The dreamer is the one who thinks of the idea. The engineer listens to that idea, tries not to laugh, because sometimes ideas seem kind of silly when you first hear them. And then reduce that to practice, basically build a prototype and work out the real world kinks. At that point, you can apply for a patent. And then finally, you now have a piece of paper and you have one prototype. It might look ugly, but it works. But you only have one of them. And then you need an entrepreneur, a business person, who can take that one prototype and manufacture them and deal with all that things like business and capital and marketing. And I guess you can hear by the tone of my voice, I am not an entrepreneur. But I am a dreamer, and I am an, an engineer, and I usually don't laugh at my ideas. And I have this nice dialogue going on inside of them. And I'm going to show you how this works with a real uh, invention I did. I invented something called a data glove oh, about 30 years ago. But it's having a resurgence. All these young people are talking about virtual reality. So I'm a granddad now, and I have kids to talk about this stuff. So basically, I had this fantasy. And You've heard uh, necessity is mother of invention, but for me it's fantasy. I had this like, dreaming idea, wouldn't it be cool if, and that's a great way to start an invention, wouldn't it be cool if when you did this, what am I doing? Exactly, I'm playing air guitar, where's the guitar? Hey, it's in my mind, as a dreamer it is. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if when you did this, you really heard Led Zeppelin or Frank Zappa or whatever your, your genre is, those are mine. Um, and that was the fantasy. And that's the dreamer. So then I talked to the engineer, who's also Tom Zimmerman. And he said, well, that's pretty cool. You know, I also play guitar. And that would be really nice. But if you really want to do that, you're going to have to measure the bending, the intricacies of the bending of the human finger. And so the engineer and me went about going about this. And long story short, I developed this flex sensor on the right. And uh, like I say, it doesn't, it doesn't have to look good to be a prototype, but it worked. Um, but that was it, and I got a patent. So now I have the dreamer and the inventor and the uh, engineer have this patent. And I didn't really know what to do with it. I was in New York. Most people thought I was crazy. And then I moved out to California because I followed a ballet dancer. Follow, you know, follow your passion, follow your love. <laughs> that brought me to California, where now on the subway you hear disk drives and megabits. And they spoke my language. And not only did they think I was not crazy, but they wanted to help fund these projects. And I met Jaron Lanier the uh, guy on the left, who was, who's basically all three, dreamer, engineer, and entrepreneur. But he really leveraged the, I really leveraged his entrepreneur skills. He really helped bring this to market. And uh, in 1987, we released the, uh, Mattel released the Power Glove, made 1.3 million of them. So um, it was really the full circle. It took about 10 years. But that's the importance of this, uh, of this triangle. And uh, someone like, look at Steve Jobs and Wozniak. I think Steve Jobs is definitely the dreamer and entrepreneur, and Woz is the, uh, the consummate engineer. And together, they made history. So I tell young people, and I, I love talking to, to young people, because they're the pipeline to you. You were all once young, right? And um, this is kind of, I tell them, anything you learn is useful. And I love that you're signing here doing ASL, because I know how to fingerspell. And the reason I do that is I grew up in New York. And on the subway, someone handed out this little chart to me. And, uh, and uh, that way, I, lear I learned fingerspelling. Um, and I used to go to Canal Street in uh, lower Manhattan, where all the electronics was. And when I was three, my mom, who's here, she's going to be 90 this summer, uh, she, uh, she told me I dragged in uh, the Christmas lights. And she was a good mother. Instead of saying bad boy, she said, good boy. You, you discovered light. Uh, and then I started playing with LEDs and phototransistors. I read about Alexander Graham Bell's microphone. He was using carbon. And when you compress it, the resistance decreases. I tried using that, but it made a big mess. 
turned out light is much better for sensors. Uh, I studied MIT, uh, mechanical engineering and uh, wind energy in the 70s, but I also studied ballet. What a weird thing to study. Well, it turns out I learned Laba notation, which is the uh, notation for dance. And when I developed these sensors that me measured uh, finger bending, because I knew about dance, I put it on my elbows and, and knees. And uh, I then uh, worked with a, a choreographer to convert muse dance into music. And I played synthesizers and had a computer. And look, it's assembly language, LDA, load uh, accumulator. So all these things came into play in making the data glove. But the backbone of my real experience and learning were mentors. And the first were my dad, who was an accountant, but he grew up on a farm in Kansas. So he knew you could do anything with bailing wire and tape. So he taught me about mechanical engineering. My mom, bless her heart, she would scar the neighborhood looking for um, uh, carriage wheels and uh, thrown out TVs because I loved making go-karts and oscilloscopes. Um, and the local library, I went back 20 years later and the librarian was still there. She said, oh, you used to hang out by the 500s. That was the science section because I used to love TV repair manuals. I learned so much in a television repair manual, a whole cornucopia of research in that little box. The Hall of Science, science museums, is a great place for kids to actually see fun things working. And finally, the mecca of science. Sorry, I'm an East Coast snob. MIT, of course. Stanford's pretty good. Berkeley's very good. But you know what can I say? We got some MITers here. I know that. And they talk about mind and hands, mind and hands. But I'm also into STEAM. Someone said STEM. You know what the A is? Art. art because art involves the heart. And uh, we had a designer here who did the ThinkPad. And he actually uh, lives in uh, Italy because he, he said you need passion to be a designer. And so it's also a way to get people who are not into science yet. If they're into art, that's a great way to pull them into science. And so here's the frustration. If you Google scientist, and you can do that if you're getting bored by me, you'll see these are the pictures, all white men with crazy hair. But that's not a lot of the world, especially the students I want to reach, women and minorities. They see this and they go, I don't want to be that. So that's why it's really important to have good mentors uh, for you to get out, and I'm sure you do, get out in the schools and turn on kids to STEM, because we, uh, we know it's fun. And so I started this in an elementary school in Cupertino which is a pretty uh, expensive place to live. Uh, and so their there's students, their parents, their high-tech uh, engineers and such. So it was pretty easy to start a volunteer program. And I taught this circuit, which is the gateway uh, to understanding so much about analog and digital electronics. Then I went to East San Jose, which is really the other side of the digital divide. A lot of these people, uh, their parents haven't even graduated high school. And what I did was I started a program called Extreme Science to show them how much fun science was. And I'm just going to share a crying moment. So I gave them all these activities. We went to a local scuba diving place. I was in a um, video store two years after this program. A, a young man walked up to me and said, hi, Mr. Zimmerman. And I said, uh, hi, who are you? He said, oh, I was in the Extreme Science program. So I said, what are you doing now? He said, oh, I'm studying marine biology. And he could see, I was like, why are you studying that? He said, oh, don't you remember? You brought me scuba diving. So one of the greatest things we can do is reach out and change someone's life. Um, I have some data. Basically, if you want to know how well an ESL student will do in any subject, see how well they do in English. If you try and take a math, a class in, uh, a math test in Thai, you're not going to do well. So that was my startling discovery. So here's some recommendations I have. I'm out of time. Uh, basically, here's the most radical idea, uh, is make school 9 to 5. Because in the, in the wealthy schools, the, oh, thank you. Let's talk <laughs> afterwards. In the wealthy schools, the parents pick them up and bring them to all these after school activities. Uh, in the not so wealthy schools, they just let them loose. Very dangerous time. That's where a lot of crime happens, pregnancies, drugs. Make the afternoon informal learning and service. Make them cook meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and bring dinner home so that students can relieve some of the burden on parents. OK, thank you for your time.